and we've driven to New York, and we've driven to all kinds of different places to watch our daughter play volleyball. This year, Geneva College played at Penn State Altoona. And so when I saw that on the schedule, I was really excited because no longer did I have to drive, like the closest one was like in uh, Latrobe, we had to drive an hour and a half to that one. And so this was really close, it was only gonna take us a few minutes to get there, and I was excited. And Hope called and said, hey, when we come into town, would you guys mind picking up food for the volleyball team? And I said, sure, what do you want? And she said, how about if you get Hauser's subs? And I said, okay. And so she called, she gave me the order of all the girls on the volleyball team. And I went to Hauser's and I ordered the subs. And then I went that day to pick up the subs, not realizing how much that was going to cost me. Like, I don't know if you've bought subs at Hauser's. They're really, really good, but they're kind of expensive too. And so imagine what it costs for a, an entire women's volleyball team. And so I went and I picked up the subs and we went to Penn State Altoona. We watched the volleyball game, gave them the subs and, and they went home, went back to the college. And then a few days later, we got an envelope in the mail and I opened the envelope and it was this card from Geneva women's volleyball team. And I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. And I turned it over and all the players on the team had signed this card. And so I was reading what Zoe wrote, I wrote what Destiny wrote, and I wrote what Abigail wrote. And so I was reading what all these girls wrote. And as I was reading it, I realized there's no hope on here. Like my daughter <laughs> did not sign the card. And so it, it, it just kind of dawned on me. And so I, I asked Hope, I said, Hope, I got that card from, from the team and everybody signed it, but I noticed that you didn't sign it. She chuckled a little bit and she said, I'm your daughter, why do I have to sign it? Which leads into an important discussion about unthankfulness, right? Unthankfulness and its synonym, ungrateful or ingratitude. Like those are some of the most ugly words in the entire English language. When we find people that are unthankful or they're ungrateful. Because when people are unthankful or ungrateful, it, it sends, it communicates the idea like uh, they didn't recognize the sacrifice that we made, or we, they didn't rec recognize the generosity that, that we extended towards them, or they, they just sometimes didn't even recognize what we did for them. And e e I think even at a deeper level, ungratefulness almost communicates the idea like, I deserved that. Or what you did for me, you had to do it because you owed it to me. Or, or I was somehow deserving of, of your generosity in my life. And, and what we're going to discover today is, is just simply this take-home truth, is that gratitude is more than an attitude. And gratitude really isn't gratitude until it's actually expressed. And in a lot of ways in which unthankfulness and ungratefulness is communicated is not communicated with words. It's oftentimes communicated with a lack of words. And as dangerous as that is in our human relationships with one another, think about how costly and how devastating it is in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father has commanded us throughout the pages of scriptures to, to be thankful, to give thanks to Him for all that He's done for us. And it leads ultimately to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, which is your memory verse for the series. People, last one, they said, how about a shorter one? So this one's shorter, but the only problem is you only have two weeks to memorize it. So, uh, and, and this is the memory verse for the series. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, God knows what's best for us. As our Heavenly Father, He wants what's best for us. And then He understands that one of the best things that we can do is extend thanksgiving and gratitude for Him for all that He's done for us. Because when we don't realize, when we don't express the gratitude and thanksgiving to God, it makes us arrogant. It, it, it puffs us up in pride. And it makes us believe that we have all that we have and we've accomplished all that we've accomplished in our own strength. But when we stop and we express gratitude and thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father, it's at that moment that we realize that what we have only comes because of His gracious hand in our lives. And so today we're going to see how gratitude is more than just an attitude and how you and I 
are to are to express gratitude not just to one another but more importantly even to our heavenly father because gratitude is more than an attitude and today we're going to be in Luke chapter 17 and it's an account that Jesus uh, an encounter Jesus had with 10 individuals who were going through uh, a very difficult time in their life and and the author here Luke he tells us at the beginning of his account of Jesus life that he thoroughly investigated everything that he wrote about in here and so this is an account that Jesus had as he was walking along with some people and we're going to understand here today that gratitude really is more than just an attitude and what i want you to see first of all the first thing that Luke mentions to us here is the request of the 10 So Jesus is walking along. It begins in verse 11 with these words. Now, as on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the the geography of Israel, this is kind of in the northern part of the nation. And and there's a border there, the Galileans and the Samaritans. and, And Jesus is walking along this border. And it's actually kind of out in the middle of nowhere. It's very sparsely populated in this was very sparsely populated in Jesus day in this part of the country and he's just walking along this border and then in verse 12 Luke said this he wrote this he said as he was going into the village 10 men who had leprosy met him they stood at a distance now as he's walking along he's ready to go into a village and he said that he fought, he saw 10 men with leprosy now, leprosy is known today as Hansen's disease. And Hansen's disease and leprosy really isn't that common in our world today. The CDC actually says that it's very rare and 95% of all people alive today actually have natural immunity to Hansen's disease. But Hansen's disease or leprosy is a bacterial infection. It's a slow growing bacteria in the body of someone that affects the nerves and can cause paralysis. It affects eyesight, numbness, all of those things. And so uh, leprosy was, was something that could be very dangerous in a person's life. And in Jesus' day, they saw leprosy as something that was extremely contagious because these people would have numbness and paralysis and and they would have burns or they would have injuries and they wouldn't even know that they injured themselves and they would be losing body parts and and, and digits off their hands and things like that. And so people were afraid of this and they thought it was very contagious. And so if you had leprosy of Jesus' day, you had to practice social distancing. You weren't even allowed to live in the town. That's why these 10 men were outside of the village. And you had to stay away from anybody. And if you were approached somebody, you had to ring a bell and let people know that you had leprosy. And people would move out of the way because they didn't want to have anything to do with you. And if you had leprosy, you weren't quite dead, but you couldn't quite live. You were kind of in this, you were, you were standing there and you had to watch everyone else live their lives, but you were an outcast. And so here, think about this. This person who had leprosy, they couldn't hold a job. Uh, they couldn't hold their children. They couldn't hold the hand of a loved one. Uh, they, they, were, they were segregated from the rest of the population. And, and here they are. This, that's why these 10 men, they're standing outside of the village. And as Jesus is entering into the village, Luke comments that they were standing. They stood at a distance because they knew that they had to social distance from everybody. In verse 13, and as they stood at this distance, in verse 13, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus Master, have pity on us. Now, Luke recorded an interesting word here. When they cried out, they said, Jesus, Master. That word master in the Greek language is only used seven times in the New Testament, and it's only used by Luke in the Gospel of Luke. And the other six times, other than this one time here, it's oftentimes used by the disciples when they were talking to Jesus. They would call him master. It was a very special term that they used for him. Now, these 10 men, we know they were not disciples of Jesus. But the point here is that Luke is saying that probably Jesus, uh, the, the acts that Jesus had performed had preceded him to this village. Like they had heard about how Jesus had healed blind people. They had probably heard about how Jesus had caused lame people to walk again. And so when they heard him that he was coming in here, they cried out to him and they called him master because they had no hope. 
They had no other options. They had no place else to go. And so Jesus was their only hope. Jesus was the only option they had left. Jesus was the only one they could go to. And I can imagine that they had to be thinking as Jesus is walking along, if he could do this for these other people, hopefully, maybe, he can do the same for us. So they called out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And what we see next in this account is the response of Jesus. So they, they call out to him, and Jesus hears them call out. And in verse 14, Luke records, when he saw them, he said, go. Now, that may not have been the first words that the, the men with leprosy wanted to hear because they'd probably heard that most of their lives when people knew that they had leprosy. You need to go. You need to go away. You need to get away from me. Just go. And so Jesus tells them to go, not so much to go away from him or get away from him. Listen to what he says. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. At which point, if I'm one of these 10 men with leprosy, my initial response is, go show the priests what? Show them that I still have leprosy? Go and show them that because of my leprosy, I need to go come back out here to the outskirts of town? You want me to go show the priests? What do you want me to show them? Because nothing has changed at this point. And most people think that Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priest. It was actually a twofold reason. Number one is if you actually had leprosy and you were healed or cleansed of leprosy, you actually then had to go to a priest, and it was the priest who then made the decision that you no longer had the social distance, that you could now be part of society again, that, that he would, the priest would make the determination that, that you could come back into normal society again. And so Jesus saying to them, I want you to go to the priest. And the second side of this is that I want you to go show yourself to the priest because by the time you make it there, you will be healed. Now, there were other times that people had leprosy and Jesus touched them or Jesus came to them and he handles this one different. He says, I just want you to go and show yourselves to the priest because what's going to happen here is these lepers are actually going to show their faith in Jesus because at this point, they haven't been healed. And what they have to do is actually take the steps to head towards the priest and simply trust Jesus and have faith in Jesus. I tell you all the time, right? Faith is just simply living like God is telling the truth. And so here, these 10 lepers, they had to have faith. They said, you know what? We're going to live like Jesus is telling the truth. And so they started to go. It says in verse 14, when they saw them, when he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went they were cleansed. They weren't healed until they actually went. Talking about 10 individuals that literally walked by faith. And Jesus said, you take the first step of faith and I will do my part. You just live like I'm telling the truth. And so they started to head to the priests and all of a sudden as they're going, all 10 of them were healed. And then what happens here is this story takes a twist. This account takes a twist, which reminds us and shows us that gratitude really is more than an attitude, because what we see next is the return of the one. Luke, t- Luke wrote, after when they went, they were cleansed in verse number 15. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. He's on his way to the priest because, right, he can't enter into normal society again until he actually sees the priest. He's on his way. He's healed. He says, I'm going to pause. I'm going to put my life on hold here because I've got to go back. I've got to go back and see the one who healed me. Before I can go to the priest and enter back into and live a normal life again, I've got to go back. And he goes back, and and, and Luke recorded this. He said he goes back praising God in a loud voice voice. Just as loud as he was yelling out earlier, Jesus, Master, have pity on me. He's crying out in the same loud voice, praising God and giving thanks to God for what Jesus had just done in his life. 
And there's no more social distancing for him because look in verse 16. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. I no longer have to remain socially distanced from anybody, but now I can thank him. And this is, this is the point that I'm trying to make, is that gratitude is more than an attitude. Gratitude is actually an action that you actually do something. And we see that here in the life of this one. He, he, I, I believe probably all ten were, were grateful that they were healed, right? But it was only one that came back and threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Because now he could hold a job. Now he could hold his children again. Now he could hold the hand of the one he loved. And so he had to do something about it. And he came back and he kind of closed the loop here. And he came back and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And I believe, I believe with all of my heart that maybe Luke smiled a little bit when he wrote these next words. Because then Luke wrote, he was a Samaritan. Of the and, and I believe probably the other nine were probably Jews, and this man was a Samaritan. And of all the ones that you would have least expected to come back and thank this Jewish rabbi, this Jewish Messiah, was the Samaritan. And that's why I believe Luke, as he's writing this, he's reminded, oh, that one was, oh yeah, I need to remind people. And he was a Samaritan. The one who may have thought he deserved it the least is the one who was thankful the most. And this is what I've learned in my life, in my almost 49 years of living, is that the people that are the most thankful are the people that are the most humble. And the people that are the most humble are the people that turn out to be the most thankful. And I've yet to figure out which comes first. Are the people humble because they're thankful or are they thankful because they're humble? But I do know that those two things go hand in hand. And here was this one who probably thought out of all the 10 that were there that day, he probably deserved the healing the least. And and he was humbled by that. And as a result of it, he had to come back and he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. And what we see here from this one's example is that gratitude really is more than just an attitude. It's actually an action. But Luke Luke, Luke drew this account to a close. And the last thing that we see here is the reaction of Jesus. As this man is at Jesus' feet, I imagine Jesus, he's looking around at all of his disciples who are standing around him. And in verse 17, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? (laughs) Guys, I'm just trying to do the math here, but there were ten. I told all ten of them to go to the priest. All ten of them were cleansed. Where are the other nine? And in the original language, when Luke wrote this in Greek, the word order actually is read this way. And he asked, and the nine are where? He's asking, like, the other nine, where the, the, those nine are where? They're, they're not here. Where are they? And again, I don't think it's the fact that those other nine were not grateful. I don't think they weren't thankful. It's just that gratitude is more than just an attitude. And gratitude really finds its fulfillment in its expression. And he said, where are they? If you, you know, if you give out Halloween candy at your house at Halloween, uh, when we lived in North Carolina, we lived in a little community, and we gave out Halloween candy. And it was the first time we'd ever done it because we never really lived in a place where we could give out Halloween candy. And so it, it was kind of neat to me because every kid that came to our door, I heard two statements from every single parent. Number one I heard was, stay off the grass. And I'm like, why can't they walk on the grass? What's wrong with that? But must have been mean people in the neighborhood didn't want them on the grass. So number one, I heard, stay off the grass. And then after I gave them candy, number two, I heard, what do you say? Did you say thank you? And both times I'd always be like, it's okay, it's okay. Because as parents, we understand that gratefulness and gratitude is is more than just an attitude. Gratitude is something that is expressed. And here, Jesus, in this encounter that Jesus has with these ten, he says, where are the other nine? Because without him, 
their life would have never changed. Without him, they were still stuck in their leprosy. Without him, they had no hope. But now he had changed everything. And he says, were there not ten who were cleansed? The other nine are where? The one opportunity they had to express their gratitude, and they missed it. And I believe what they did is they ran to the priest as fast as they probably could the moment they realized they were cleansed and they could not wait to go on with the rest of their lives. And though they may have been thankful and though they may have had gratitude and had an attitude of gratitude, they never really expressed it. And now we, we come to the end of this, and oftentimes when we read this, and I don't think you're probably different than I am, but oftentimes when we read that, we think, yeah, where are those other nine? Those ungrateful jerks? Like, why didn't they come back and give thanks to Jesus for what he had done? If I was one of those nine, I would have come back. Oh, really? Think about it. Think about those times in your life when you went through just difficult times in your life, Right? And you were fervent in prayer, and you, and you just wanted you wanted a, a closeness with God that you'd never had before in your life. And so you were praying more, you were reading your Bible more, you were showing up for church more. You, 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 you I mean, you changed the radio station in your car to the Christian station because you wanted to listen to the Christian music while you were driving back and forth to work. And then. Right, And then things started to get a little bit better. The sun started to shine again. You started to come out of the storm and found out you weren't praying quite as much. Didn't read the Bible quite as much. Church attendance didn't seem quite as important. The radio got put back to the presets that were there instead of the Christian station. And we're all guilty of this to some degree, right? We, we, we want that closeness with God when things are bad, but then when, things, when God starts to change the circumstances, we almost seem to forget the one who changed the circumstances. I was living in Maryland, and I was pastoring a church there when September 11th happened. And the Sunday after September 11th, like we had like 20 new people that showed up for church for the very first time. And the couple weeks after that, more new people started to come. And then about nine months later, all those new people had shown up in, in the wake of September 11th, most of them, we didn't see again. Because in the difficult times, we really want God, but when things start to turn better for us, it's almost as if we forget to give thanks and show the gratitude for what he's done in our life. So because that is true, what should you do? I want to encourage you today that through this week, through the rest of your life, is just express gratitude. Express gratitude. Now, expressing gratitude doesn't come natural for us. And how do I know that? The reason I know that is because there is command after command after command throughout the pages of scriptures for us to be thankful. If it came natural to us, God wouldn't have to remind us to be thankful because naturally he understands that we have a selfish heart. And so God, for our good and for our benefit, encourages us to be thankful repeatedly throughout the scriptures. I went through some of the Psalms. Okay, in Psalm chapter 106, verse 1, it tells us this, Praise the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The psalmist there tells us, he says, give thanks. In Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 118, 1, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, and His love endures forever. Let me just stop. What do you think Psalm 146, 1 says? Okay, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. Repeatedly, the psalmist is telling the people of God, give thanks to God. Think about his goodness. Think about his love that endures forever and give thanks to God. It's not just enough to have an attitude of gratitude, but actually express that gratitude. And if, again, if that expression came naturally, we wouldn't have all these commands to tell us to give thanks. And I believe maybe Paul was thinking about all these Psalms when he wrote 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let me just tell you this. In light of that verse right there, 
If you are not consistently expressing thanksgiving in your life, you're outside the will of God. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So express thanksgiving. The nine, the nine are where? And there is great concern that Jesus has for the nine who didn't return. Were there not ten healed? The nine are where? So as I was thinking about it uh, last couple of weeks, how do we express gratitude? Because it's still kind of that thing that, that I really don't have a complete handle on. Like how do we practically, in, in practicality, in tangible ways, how do we express thanksgiving? I came up with a, just a pretty quick list here. Spend time in prayer and Bible reading. Like when we do that, we're showing God that we're thankful for what he's done in our life. Forgive other people as God has forgiven you. Serve other people with your time, with your talents, with your abilities, with the gifts that God has given to you. Be generous in your time, your talents, and your treasures. Like We're going to talk about that more next week, about how thankfulness ought to generate in us uh, a generosity that is, that is amazing. And so spend time passionately praising God with, with other believers. Just simply sometimes tell God, like tell Him, thank you. Think about Think about if you were to put, make a pie chart of your prayer time. How much of it is giving thanks and how much of it is just asking for stuff? Okay, And maybe spend a little bit more time just telling God thank you. And then here's a novel idea. like Thank the people that God has used in your life to get you to where you are today. See, when, when we express thanksgiving... It's, it's kind of an admission. It's an admission to God that we are grateful for His help, understanding and acknowledging. Like, thanksgiving and gratefulness is not a weakness. It's actually a sign, I think, of spiritual maturity. Because when we are eternally thankful, when we express gratitude in our lives, what we're acknowledging to God is that I'm where I'm at because of your grace. I have what I have today because of your grace. I am who I am today by your grace. And it's then when we express our thanksgiving in those very tangible ways that we're acknowledging that we would not be where we are today without him. So I want to encourage you. Don't be like the nine who turned their backs. Be like the one who turned back and express gratitude, because gratitude is more than an attitude. In my office, I have two file folders, and they are, they are overflowing. I'm thinking about just putting it all in a box. But I, every, every card, every thank you note, everything like that that I've received in the last 15 years, I've put in a file folder, and I actually call it my antidepressant file. So uh, when I'm feeling down and gloomy, I open it up and, oh, people actually love me. Okay. And so uh, I use it at times like that. And so I have all of these things in, in these file folders, and it's overflowing. And like I said, I'm, I'm thinking about putting them all in a box. And I'll tell you this, every thank you note that I've ever received in my life, like I cherish that. Because somebody took time out of their time to express thanksgiving and gratitude for something that I've done or something that I said or time that I used. Think about how much more precious that is to our Heavenly Father. When we take time out of our time just to express thanksgiving and gratitude to Him. And so this week, you're going to hear it all. You're going to hear it a hundred times this week. I have an attitude of gratitude. And you're going to push back and say, no, no, no. Gratitude is more than an attitude. Gratitude is actually something that I put into practice in my actions. And you will be glad that you did. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the ways in which it speaks to us and the examples that we have throughout the pages of Scripture. And as we stand here as believers, we are humbled, 
humbled, first of all, by the fact that you would just even choose to redeem us in your grace. But even on top of that, all the ways in which you have blessed us, the ways in which you've cared for us, and the ways in which you have demonstrated yourself big and real and evident in our lives. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've done in us and through us. And God, I pray that as we enter into this week and as we set time aside as a culture and as families and as individuals, I pray most importantly that we would find practical, tangible ways to express our gratitude and our thanksgiving for all that you have done in our lives. And may you receive the glory and the honor and the praises to your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.